Good afternoon, good evening. I hope there's no good morning anywhere right now. Um, and uh, it is my privilege and honor as a chair to welcome you all to this session. Um, old faces, new faces. Actually, I haven't seen any new faces on all the panelists, which is fantastic for me. Um, and as I always like to point out, I'm always glad when you honor us with your presence. And uh, I hope that never changes. Um, I want to thank my colleagues who put together the original program from which this book has emerged. Um, I hope I don't leave anybody out, but I know that, you know, Professor Carol Boyce Davis, Professor Andre Therese Asiel Lumumba, Professor Richie Richardson, uh, were the principal people who put this together with a whole lot of support from other units on campus, students, you know, both graduate and undergraduates, and, you know, uh, of course, the Edmondson family. Um, so I want to thank you all for putting this together and for working <clears throat> over the course of the last two years to bring the book to fruition and to bring today's event uh, about. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for your work, but I cannot even thank you enough for flying the flag of Africana and reminding people once again why this center and what it does matter, both in the lives of Cornell, but also in the life of the United States, of the rest of the African diaspora, and especially in light of today's event in Africa, you know, the homeland for all of us, uh, as we say. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank Professor Edmondson, you know, um, for living a life that's worthy of celebration. Because if he had not led this life, if he had not done what he had done, he have, if he had not done it with such excellence, both at the professional level, but also, and just as important, at the personal, the human level, uh, we would not be having this day. And to know that this was not just a labor of love, it is also a celebration of a model of Africana scholarship, Africana being, Africana teaching, and Africana research that we all who are new to this, especially for you know, younger and upcoming generations, need to take very seriously. Um, I told people when this event originally held, of course, I could not have presumed to know Professor Edmondson. But even from the little that I knew, some of what transpired at this event when it originally held, you know, exposed to me things that I think all of us can benefit from, most especially how to handle the young, how to mentor younger people, how to inspire them to always do better you know, than they ever thought that they could do. And that kept being repeated you know, during the original presentations. And that's part of what I mean by, you know, uh, I have no doubt in my mind that you know, Professor Edmondson was not doing all that because he was looking forward to a day you know, um, like this or like you know, when the event took place, he just did it because that's who he is. And that's what he thought was the right thing to do and he did it, and here we are. Thanks for giving us a model, and thanks for leading your life the way you did, and thanks for inspiring all of us, and on a personal level, for always being kind to me, and always sharing great conversations with me, asking me crazy questions, and celebrating our common Yoruba heritage. Uh, so uh, for that, you know, uh, I will thank you. I want to thank the Edmondson family uh, also, you know, for their part, you know, in this. And uh, Elizabeth at two levels, personal and professional. Um, professionally, you know, um, both when I was DUS and since I became chair, she never fails to let me know things that are going on that are good for Africana and things that need to be done. And for me, 
yes, it's one thing to have an administrator just write to me. There's always a personal dimension when this is somebody that I know personally, somebody whose relationship I really do treasure. And I hope that we continue to do our work both professionally, but always and never without the human touch. And for that, you know, uh, I'm very, very grateful. Of course, I'm looking forward to today's panel. I hope that, uh, you know, everybody who has signed on lives here, you know, uh, with a little bit more education that they came into it and that the book that we are celebrating and the people who are celebrating them have a good life way beyond today's celebration. Thank you all very much for coming. <clears throat> May I thank you for those very kind words, Sherry? Thank you. I'm still around, but I, COVID I in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, a, not at the office as often as I used to be. I know. I know. You know I'm, I'm hiding from these vicious American diseases, not world. <laughs> I Remember, know. I know where to find you when I want you. So you, you sir, and I'm glad you men, I'm glad you mentioned the family because you all know I don't have to tell you this. I'm still pre-technological. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Without, without my dear wife Elizabeth, I would be totally lost. Thank you. On some of these things. Okay. I'm like you. I'm glad you know your limits. So. <laughs> <laughs> More ways you model for us, I tell you that. <laughs> okay. So well, who's, kick, who's kicking uh, off? Okay, go ahead. Yes, I'll move uh, next week. Yeah, so my, mine is a more a bit technical. Um, I, um, I want to thank you on behalf of the Africana Programming Committee, uh, of which uh, I'm the chair but I work uh, with my colleagues, Professor Richet Richardson and Professor Tao Li Goff, uh, who are members of this uh, committee. So we thank everyone in the Africana Studies on campus and from across the globe who have joined us uh, today. I want to appreciate uh, the dedication of Dana Penisi uh, in the Africana uh, office, well, virtual office, <laughs> as, a, as a graduate field um, uh, and uh, event coordinator for her diligence. I don't know if Lauren is here today, but she has been uh, through the semester, the Africana student employee who has been there when we hold this program. Because we want to show that this is not a single event. We build on what we have done. Let me remind you or very briefly what we have done this semester. We kicked off with a, a book by Professor Naminata Diabate, uh, Naked Agency, Genital Cursing and Biopolitics in Africa. Uh, and then the next uh, event was uh, by uh, Professor Riche Richardson on her book, Emancipation Daughters, Reimagining Black Femininity and the National Body. And then we had last month a panel uh, which was uh, entitled No Greater Burden, Health and the Weight of the World on Black Women with top, uh, four top medical doctors and a psychologist, Dr. Evelyn Cantillo, Dr. Elena Desi, Dr. Johnny uh, Haldun, uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, and the moderator, uh, Leslie Alexander. Uh, I don't know if I'm forgetting somebody, but there were, there were four of them and uh, we were helped by uh, uh, Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Africana O'Connell uh, alumnus. So it was a very powerful panel. Uh, Jonel was uh, the one who helped us. And next week, we will have our final event of the, the year. Uh, it will be a part of the, our belated celebration of the Africana at 50 that uh, we couldn't uh, hold because of the, the, the phenomenon that you know. Um, and uh, it will be a major address by Professor Michel Mugo on the topic of the imperative of Utu Ubuntu in scholarship 
if Africana studies and research are to be celebrated as a liberated zones in academia. Very powerful. So we invite you to come back next week, Wednesday, May 5th, from 4 to 5.30. So the poster is almost ready. It will be out. So let me for now, uh, I, I want to also acknowledge, although I will thank him at the end, uh, Eric um, um, Akri, uh, who is the director of the uh, uh, John Henry Clark Africana Library. He was instrumental even when we were organizing the conference uh, for Professor Edmondson. And he had played a role all the way to his contribution today. So I want to acknowledge him. So now Professor Boyce Davis will uh, present the program for today. Professor Boyce Davis, to you. Thank you so much. Um, so I will, I want to talk about the project and locate it within the context of Pan-Africanism. So if you will permit me, I will briefly share my screen. Okay. So Pan-African, our program today, I should start by saying is called Pan-African Connections, which is the same name, of course, um, title we have given to the book project. And a copy of it is on the first screen that you're looking at, um, uh, which is being published by Africa World Press under the leadership of Castellum Chicoli. Pan-Africanism began as a formal ideological principle for Africans at home and abroad. Um, Henry Sylvester Williams, of course, took the leadership, a Caribbean lawyer who organized the first conference and named this field in July 1900 at the Westminster Hall in London. What you're looking at in the middle is a poster of that event. It served as ideological anchor then for Africa and the African diaspora throughout the 20th century. Uh, as you uh, know from all of the, the various developments that happened throughout that century and into the present. Early coverage of, the, of that uh, 1900 Pan-African Conference, which I love to uh, share, describes delegates um, who represented the United States, Canada, Ethiopia, Haiti, Liberia, Sierra Leone, the then Gold Coast, most of the islands of the then British West Indies, and importantly, in their powerful US delegation with W.B. Du Bois, Miss Anna Jones, Kansas, Mrs. Annie Cooper, who uh, we know is Anna Julia Cooper of Washington, D.C. So essentially, the first Pan-African conference, what you're looking at is uh, another poster which describes it. And we're really fortunate under the leadership of Hakim Adi to have been able to retrieve quite a bit of this. What you're looking at, sorry, is the second um, major conference, the one which convened in Manchester, England. I was so pleased to be able to go there and actually I took a photograph of it. But in that conference, uh, many people indicate um, the, the range of people who then would become leaders in Africa. This is, if you go to that place in Manchester, which is actually now at, on the grounds of that university, you can actually see this identifying um, round marker, which indicates where the conference was held in 1945. And it indicates decisions taken at this conference led to the liberation of African countries. You can see below participants included Ras Makonen, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, Amy uh, Garvey, that would be Amy Ashwood Garvey, W.B. Du Bois, George Padmore, and so on. The orientation then of connections that we wanted to work with um, is precisely what the intent of Pan-Africanism was. And according to Tony Martin, our lost brother who passed a few years ago, it includes six dominant ideas that form the basis of Pan-Africanism consistently. A global African community, Africa's base, return ideological or emotive, or physical, of course, sometimes, a politically unified continent, a race-based global movement with continental United States of Africa, economies that bring together Africa and the African diaspora if possible outside of European globalization, pan-African political impact on world affairs. And this is, you will find this in the Encyclopedia of the African Diaspora. So to the project, what we wanted to do, as you know from the conference, was to bring together the intent of pan-African connections through the lived experience of one of our 
distinguished colleagues, but also distinguished contributor to actually the formation of definitions and, and um, practice or praxis, we could see, of Pan-Africanism. Edmondson operated in a Pan-Africanist context consistently throughout his life. Uh, and he remained consistently then um, a person who was able to articulate one of the key areas of Pan-Africanism as it relates to academic and political inquiry in Africanist studies. For him, like for example, his most popular course at Cornell was called Pan-African Freedom Fighters in their own words, which took students through a, a thinking of a cross-section of activists uh, historically through their writings and speeches. But of course, we know these connections were also personal. And this is one of the things we like about this collection that it also has a section which highlights a lot of amazing uh, personal and social connections and professional ones, of course, that you will learn about today from Makerere to Mona and then to Ithaca. Colleagues, students and friends from far and near came as you know to our symposium to testify. Uh, and when they could not attend physically as in the case of Peter, Peter Phillips sent uh, written notes or video statements. So Horace Campbell, who was then in Ghana as the Kwame Nkrumah chair, uh, fortunately, we are able to have him here with us today. Uh, Ngugi Wapiongo sent a statement which was read by his son Mukoma Wangugi. And of course, Anya Nyango, uh, Nyango, who we are still expecting to show up in this program today because he's vlogging from Kenya, also sent a statement. And as Professor Lumumba indicated, the organizing committee included Professor Lumumba, of course, uh, who was co-editor of the volume with me, uh, Mr. Erica Cree, director of the John Henry Clark African Library, Mrs. Elizabeth Edmondson, and of course, with the kind assistance of then Africana Studies Research Center graduate program staff, Reem Saladin Atabani, who did a super job of the technical aspects of the program. And then we have two grad students who really worked with us to help get the document in shape um, uh, to make it become the finished product that it is today. So an intellectual life then that moved through many of the key locations of the African diaspora marks the trajectory of Loxley Edmondson from his place of birth in Jamaica to his study in the UK to live and work in Canada, the United States, Uganda, and with a range of other locations such as North Africa and Vietnam along the way. It was my pleasure to work on this symposium and to work with Professor Edmondson for all of the reasons already identified. But for us, the larger consideration of this collection of Pan-African connections is, of course, that Pan-Africanism remains an intellectual area, an area of political and intellectual inquiry. We see this as an important re-engagement to data and at the personal and intellectual level. Pan-African connections is, for me, a redemption song always, a current contribution to ongoing discussions and movements in our global African world as we advance another generation into leadership. So I am so thrilled, I'm so pleased to be able to introduce poet Sitsi Jaji, who has a PhD in comparative literature at Cornell University um, and is an associate professor of English and African American studies, African and African American studies at Duke University. She's the author of Africa in Stereo. I need to put on my glasses. Sorry, y'all. Africa uh, in Stereo, Music, Modernism, and Pan-African Solidarity, Oxford 2014, and two poetry collections, Beating the Grace 2017 um, and Mother Tongue 2019, winner of the Cave Canyon Northwestern University Press Poetry Prize. Her essays appear in Research in African Literatures in Car Journal of Contemporary African Art, publications of the Modern Language Association, New Literary History, and Modern Fiction Studies. She has received fellowships from the National Humanities Center, the Schomburg Center, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and she will use a recently awarded New Directions Fellowship for, um, from the Mellon Foundation to support her studies in musicology, building on training as a concert pianist for a book on Black composers and poets, exploring art songs as literary commentary. I want to add that her her thesis advisor is none other than Professor Ann Adams, but also that I was so pleased. I wasn't, I wasn't the advisor. I wasn't the committee chair, but I was. Okay, but you are the committee. <laughs> okay. But, no, but I want to add that um, I saw her last week on a program called Words Across Waters, which included um, David Rather from Trinidad uh, Tobago and um, Man Warren also from Tree Canal. And I was so touched that I thought that it would be an amazing contribution to our program if she graced us 
with one or two of her poems. So Sitsi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I am so incredibly honored to be here as part of this. Um, uh, I consider Anne Adams uh, the, the living ancestor of my ideas and in many ways uh, somebody who has uh, embodied exactly what Professor Taiwo spoke of um, in terms of the, the, the example and excellence of Professor Edmondson as a mentor. So thank you, Carol, for inviting me and thank you to the editors and the contributors for your work. Um, I would like to share two poems. The first one is um, a, a reflection on how as a student at Cornell, very much touched by all of the work that was happening at Africana, um, I really uh, learned to think about how uh, one must begin at home um, and particularly in one's own language. And I would say not only one's uh, um, linguistic language, but one's conceptual language. And um, I came here really wishing, came to, to Cornell <laughs> really wishing I had cultivated stronger um, uh, anchorings in my first time, um, Shona. Um, but I came to realize that that's really a conceptual project. Um, and so I'm going to read uh, a praise poem to my ancestral figure, um, Vanyemba, which is also the praise greeting um, of our totem um, zebra. And then I'll read a poem that I shared on, um, on Thursday last week. Um, and I, I share this because I think this is an intellectual feast that we've come to, sorry. <laughs> come, let us eat. Come, let us pray. Our grandmother, Vanyemba, we bless you. Grandmother, we sing your name in the fields and in the mountains. Ambuya, sinorumbiza zitare nyumuminda. You died for your land, but you were victorious. Praises, grandmother, high praises. Give us this day plenty of sweet potatoes. Oh, how we rejoice to eat your sweet potatoes. And how we love to eat your sugar beans. For we are your great grandchildren raised at your breast. Yes. We come from the land of sweet potatoes. Wungu, kumusha kwedu, de kwachi ota. Praise be, sweet sugar bean. Mupururu kwamuri, vanyemba. And I say that also as praises to Carol and to Ndri and all those who came together to bring this edition um, together. Thank you for the work that you've done. Um, Oh, thank you. The second poem that I want to share is um, one very much shaped by the moment that we're in, which always seems to be an unending moment um, of anti-Black violence, um, but the, the struggles that um, have emerged from resisting these multiple forms through colonialism, slavery, police brutality, and so on and so forth are grounded in the continuities of the Pan-African continuum. I wrote this poem in memory of Tamir Rice, a 12 year old who was shot in Cleveland um, by the police. To bless the memory of Tamir Rice, plant 12 date palms in a ring around the tarmac, make them tall, slight towers, leaning into the wind as princes do. Fear that the sweetness of dates will churn your stomach, plant them anyway. Plant the pudge of his fuzzless face in the arrested time of a school portrait. Plant his exotic name found in a book that spelled dreams of eminence and hope for an uncertain coupling in your ear. 
Know that whether it leaches into the soil or not, this ground was watered with his blood. This tarmac turned a rioting red, strike that. There was a screech of brakes and sirens howling like a cliche, then a volley of pops that might have been a game if only what came next was not such utter silence. The tarmac was red. There was no riot. Build a circle of palms and something to keep them safe. Build a greenhouse around the 12 palms. Yes, a green house. This land is not our land. Dig up the tarmac, the dark, heavy loam of this side of town. Be sure to wear gloves as you dig through the brown fields mystification. Once the Cuyahoga River was a wall of fire. God knows how rain melts metal. Dig into that earth and build a foundation, quarry it. Let the little boys and little girls of Shaker Heights and Orange bring a Game Boy or cell phone or other toy made out of coltan that chances are a little boy or little girl dug up by hand in the DRC. Let the children lay their shiny toys in the foundation. Seal up ground with molten lead. Die cast, it's melted weight. Yes, make a type caster's mold and leave it dull gray like flint. Stamp out a broadside, only set it in the foundation's floor. Let us read the letter that says this officer was unfit. Let us go over it step by step every time we walk toward the green house of imagining what this boy's boyhood should have been, the fulfilling of his name his promise, plant an oasis here. How is not my problem? Let someone who remember how cook the rice, let she cook the rice with palm oil till it's yellow and sticky. Of course them have palm oil in Cleveland. There's no third world we living in. Let she cook she rice and beans. Let she say how she know to do it from a film she seen in the film. Them people from the Sea Island, gone to Sierra Leone, and them a fine day people. The people that sing the same song with the same words. Come to find out them words is not just play, play words. Them words for weeping. So them a sit down together and weep together. A South Carolina and Sierra Leone family. They weep over the war and the water and the fresh and the forgotten and they cook that rice till it's yellow and sticky. They yam it with the hand out of banana leaf and the old, old man, you must say, you never forget the language you cry in. Let all them little girls from Shaker Heights skip the gymnastic meat. Let them come and eat rice and eat rice till they don't want to eat rice no more and let them still have rice to eat. Let them lose their innocence. Let horizons settle low. Let dates and raisins and apples and nuts seem a strange mockery of the new, the sweet, the hoped for. Let us share the matter. Let us sit here under these date palms and haggle over whose fault it is. Let the rage that says tear this shit down, tear this shit down. Let us start with the glass walls of the greenhouse as a demonstration. Let the rage that says I cannot speak, not speak. Let it suck speech into its terrible maw and leave us shuddering in silence. Let the rage that says black lives matter, matter. Let that other rage that says all lives matter be torn down. Let the matter with how we don't all matter in the same way churn up a monumental penitence. Let the date palm offer us shade. Let us ask why we are still here. Let us lower our eyes as we face his mother, his father, his sister. Ashay, Ashay Tsitsi, proud of you and your work. Proud that you are Cornell graduate. Thank you. Keep going you. and keep doing all this wonderful.
projects that you indicate and love your son and enjoy him. I mean, mm. <laughs> black young men and women are treated. We have to celebrate all the time our, our ability to be here still, right? Yeah. yeah. So Thank you. Well. Thank you for doing this. Mm, really thank you for having me. Okay. I, she was saying she was happy to come home in this way. So this is really cool. Yeah, so I want to just briefly talk about the collection. Um, I'll share screen again so you can see what's in it. And hopefully this will encourage you to acquire copies so that we can make sure the information circulates, right? Okay, we did this already. Okay, so this, as we said, is the cover. This is the book. Make sure you remember it and make sure you get a copy. So included in the, ta is, uh, in the table of contents, you will see a two sections. Section one, reflections and testimonies. It begins, of course, with the introduction. Uh, Praise from Ngugi Wapiongo, Makirere by Anya Nyongo, Teaching and Mentoring a Future Politician by Peter Phillips. Historical and Intellectual Context, Journey of a Quiet Pan-Africanist by Horace Campbell. International Race Relations or the Politics of We and They by James Mittelman, who is here, as is Horace. Um, pedagogy, the Professor and the World, Teacher, Activist, and Inspiration by Paul Sawyer. Pedagogy and Practice in Honor of a Teacher by Jonathan Jansen. And Mind, Body, Heart, Cornell Collaborations and Service by Risa Leibowitz. You will hear from some of these in a short while. Then we have a second section called uh, on essays, intellectual activism, institutions, women in Pan-Africanism. And that includes an uh, essay by Michelle Mugo, Pan-Africanist Connectivity and Being Rooted in Black Africana Studies, Reflections on the African Diaspora, Connections, Challenges and Trends by Eddie Green, Global Impact Scholarship and Activism in Africa and the World, Daryl Thomas, Ghana's Du Bois Center, Function and Symbol of Pan-Africanism in the 21st Century, Anne Adams, who is with us today. Adwa, Pan-African University, Conception and Implementation by Ayele Bekere, and Professor Indri's uh, contribution, Students of Global Africa and Pan-African Consciousness, Engagements for Changes in the 20th Century and Beyond. And what we were really pleased to include were the work by some of our own graduate students uh, and who were taking at that time a course I was teaching called Pan-Africanism and Feminism, Emma Kyoko on beauty and the possibilities of feminist Pan-Africanism with Una Mas and Zamata and the Star, uh, Nicole Mensa, When Women Stand Up, the stories of Ya Asantua and Nima Giboui, and Nicole should be here, I believe, uh, Kanyan Sola, who is definitely here, uh, Dr. Kanyan Sola O'Bayan, one of our recent PhD graduates from our department, Challenging Africa's Single Story, Afropolitanism and the Politics of Africa Rising, and then afterward by Professor Indri Asiyah Ramumba. Those were the connections. I want to say to I noted a really um, important colleague here uh, who is in the audience. This is Kanyan's image here, um, and this is an image of him with Ms. Sherry Mugo. I'll stop sharing. We will have a short slideshow in the end. But I noticed that there's clearly um, really a lovely audience, including Abdul Nanji. Abdul Nanji, big shout out to you, major teacher of Swahili at Cornell for a number of years. And also interesting colleagues uh, and others that we know, including Loretta McNair. I see you. Make sure you all keep your comments coming. If you have them, we'll be able to respond to them towards the end. Erica Cree, shout out to you as well. Uh, for being the major solid colleague you are. And, uh, and I noticed Michelle Selman is here from her note that she says everything in African culture has is imbued with rhythm, beauty, and sound in response to Sitsi's poem. Uh, she said, I did not understand the language, but my soul did. Thank you. Language is sound. Thanks for sharing. So this leads me then to the really wonderful part, uh, more wonderful part of this evening's event, uh, and that will be contributor statements. I've given them like five minutes each, um, but we know academics are, uh, but we hope you stay within the nice, you know, three to five minutes range. Um, if you go over a little bit, we won't like snag you right away, but we'll let you know. So Professor Eddie Green, please. Chairman, co-chairs, distinguished, 
colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege for me to be engaged in this event to honor a distinguished scholar, gentleman, friend with whom I have been associated for over four decades. My contribution to this enterprise explores a small component of Professor Edmondson's intellectual output. It focuses on reflecting on some selected pathways of his work in which his cultural identity and personal interests collide. In identifying also the related challenges and triumphs, which is really um, the kernel of the essay that I wrote, and then speculating on directions his scholarship may lead current and future generations to, um, to pursue. Uh, let us talk a little about the identification of four pathways of Professor Edmondson's endeavors. Uh, these uh, underscore his philosophical moorings that unite the various elements of the African diaspora in ancestry, in the oppression and suffering on the uh, European conquerors. In fact, um, there is a, a particular format in these four pathways, which I will identify just briefly. Uh, first, it has to do with the links between um, transatlantic slavery and racism and the internationalization of the, um, of the diaspora and the internationalization of race in the diaspora. Second, it has to do with the racism as a consequence of slavery. And here is where I think I quote from uh, Professor Edmondson because this is profound. He says, in the absence of slavery, through which racial prejudices and, and discrimination were systematized, matters of race and color would not have been destined to play so important a role in modern political and socioeconomic thought. And then in the other pathway, which is important, he speaks of the African diaspora, Pan-Africanism and the North and the North American variant. And then there is the fourth um, pathway, the rise of capitalism as integrally related to racial exploitation. And so having established those, my essay tried to talk about the spin-offs from Professor Edmondson's research. And it really says that these spin-offs really beckon uh, current and future scholars. At the time of the symposium, I was the UN special envoy for the Caribbean and therefore I was really interested in dealing with the connections that were priority of the UN system. And therefore, one of the spin-offs was achieving the targets of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. In particular, the one that the, the umbrella one 16 that deals with institutional strengthening to achieve peace, security, and social justice, which underpinned the messages in, in, um, in the philosophy of uh, Professor Edmondson. Then um, the other was the strengthening of the regional integration systems, which are so important for cohesion and for effective action of the diaspora in multilateral institutions like the UN and WTO. And then there was a comment to terms, so to speak, with the persistence of the Black American dilemma, which require learning the lessons offered by the diaspora and its reaction to institutional racism. There was also a spin-off, which I'm pleased to see um, in this book, taken up by, um, by women and feminist scholars, um, highlighting women and the future of the movement for equality and human rights. Uh, the reason is, so important because at the inception of Pan-Africanism, 
as an international movement at the start of the 20th century, um, the leadership of, and the role of women um, were really non-existent or minimal. All that has changed now. And there is a very important program being advocated and implemented and rolled out by the UN. Every woman, every child reflecting the SDG five resonating globally. And then there is this one, which is so important, um, making the case for reparations. This is initiated and, and it is very important to note, it was initiated by the CARICOM delegation at the 2001 International Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination and Xenophobia in Durban, South Africa. It is directly linked to Professor Ed Edmondson's articulation of processes uh, that connect transatlantic slavery, racism and marginalization that is advocated now uh, very importantly by the CARICOM Reparations Commission and by the Global Commission in Reparations. So how did I try to conclude um, my contribution and more importantly, this brief, um, this brief, um, I would say intervention. And I could merely sketch the lessons learned from Professor Edmondson's careful crafting of the African, African-American and Caribbean connections. There are so many underlying factors with which to grapple and so many directions in which his body of work leads us. The challenges, however, and the triumphs of this connection, he identifies with establishing benchmarks for scholars, practitioners, and policymakers. It is clear that this celebration of Professor Loxley Edmondson's magnificent career helps to guarantee his legacy in promoting Africa, African Caribbean um, relations and the role of the African diasporas, uh, a term he uses in international relations. I want to end by congratulating professors Carol um, Boyce Davis and Teresa Ansi Lubumba for their efforts in compiling and editing the set of essays from the 2017 symposium, the delightful symposium at Cornell, and for coordinating the launch of this book which deservingly memorializes Loxley Edmondson. I am indeed honored to be included in this landmark occasion and join in wishing Loxley and Elizabeth continued happiness in this phase in the life of an amazing human being who happens to be an outstanding scholar. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Green. I learned last week, Professor Green is the past president of the Caribbean Studies Association. And now you are vice chancellor of the University of Guyana. Am I correct? Chancellor, chancellor sorry, not vice chancellor. Oh, oh no. my goodness. Major, major, that's even um, <laughs> more um, major props that I have, have to add to your, um, your accolades and making sure that people know who you are and the that you are with us today. That's it. Okay. Chancellor Green. So we go now. I'm not sure if um, Dr. Nyango, Governor Professor Anya Nyango is on. If he is, can you let me know? He's on. Is he on? Yeah. He's on. Okay. Wonderful. Professor Governor Anya Nyango. I'm really pleased that we are able to have him because he was not able to be physically with us at the symposium. So the power of transatlantic internet connections and so on makes this possible. Professor Nyango, you are on, please. Thank you very much, my dear friend. Um, it is almost midnight here, you know, in Nairobi. So uh, <laughs> one of the reasons why I joined late is because I was asleep. And waking up and trying to do these gadgets is not easy, but I made it nonetheless. Let me begin by thanking you very much for inviting me to come and honor my old professor, Professor Loxley Edmondson, there are many ties that bind me with Professor Edmondson. Uh, first of all, um, we remember Professor Edmondson mainly 
in his years at McKerry, which were extremely productive years. Professor Edmondson, along with Ali Mazrui, Ahmed Mohidin, Okelo Chuli, and those dynamic professors and lecturers at University, McKerry University then, really formed us as students and future academics and people who played various roles in life in Africa and elsewhere. But personally, I have a special connection with Professor Edmondson. When he was at Makerere in the late 60s, there were very dynamic years, and he was teaching this course on uh, uh, political, political sociology and uh, political development in Africa, in which Pan-Africanism featured prominently and our connections with uh, Africa in diaspora. And I remember very well that Professor Edmondson is the person who introduced me to the struggles of Black Americans and the Caribbeans. Then uh, we got to know organizations like Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee. As he was speaking to us about this in the lecture room, he would be smoking a packet of cigarette after the other. I don't know whether Professor Edmondson still smokes, but that was his characteristic. And he was always wearing African clothes, dashikis, and so on, and he was known for that. But much more important is when we as students demanded that there should be a university-wide course which all students could take on uh, to know Africa. And he organized a university-wide course on general development studies. And as a student leader, he invited me and a few others to help him develop this course and help him teach that course with other lecturers in the university. It was a most productive year when Edmondson taught that course. I remember it so well. And therefore, I would say that in our formation as students and our political views, we owed a lot to Professor Edmondson. In 1971, winding the clock forward, so when I was going to graduate school at the University of Chicago, I decided that I would stop in New York and go and visit Edmondson at Cornell University because I thought I could not get a better introduction into the US than by visiting my old professor Edmondson at Cornell. So I'm really happy that this uh, occasion, uh, this fantastic discussion, this launch of this book is being held at the same university that I first stepped into in the US on my way to graduate school at the University of Chicago. And my friend, uh, Therese there, and uh, his wife, Lumumba, uh, were colleagues, students at the University of Chicago. And I'm glad that Therese has done with you this wonderful job of putting this book together for Professor Edmondson. One last thing, because you gave us five minutes, and then you can release me to go and sleep. One last thing, though, that if I remember well, is Loxley Edmondson who first critiqued for us American democracy. And I think introduced me to a book called Democracy for the Few. I can't quite remember the author now, but that book had quite an impact on me as a young man. And I came to the US not blind that was a fantastic democracy in the US, but it was, as Edmondson taught us, a democracy for the few. Nothing can be more further from the truth today as we see uh, the trials of that fellow, that crazy fellow who killed Floyd, George Floyd, and uh, the outcome of that trial. But what is going on here actually in the newspapers in Kenya is that that is just the beginning of police reform in the US because we ourselves know that we had a terrible authoritarian presidential regime here and we had to wage tremendous struggles to get rid of it and prove police brutality was no different, I think, from police brutality in the US. Uh, I, I, that's a yet another story to be told, but at least we did manage through the second liberation to open up the system and make it perhaps democracy for the more than few. And I think that we have a lesson to learn between uh, the struggles for second liberation in Africa and uh, what is going on in the Caribbean and the US and in Latin America regarding black people's global struggle for liberation. And therefore, Pan-Africanism is not yet dead. If anything, we are seeing the dawn of a new Pan-Africanism Pan -Africanism globally, 
where the second liberation of all communities in the world of colored people is in the offing. So I do hope that this is not the last such conference we are going to have to hold. Notwithstanding COVID, we can still use this technology of Zooming that between you and us in Africa, we should have more of this so that we can compare notes and get to understand our societies as they emerge into the 22nd century. I hope it is indeed the 21st of the one gone by. And to realize that in the next decade or so, much more should happen in Africa and in the Americas to realize the goals of the second liberation, just as our ancestors or our first nationalists when they emerged in Manchester in the year 1945 to launch the Pan-African movement, that, that movement still has the momentum to be carried out by those of us who are still alive. So I really want to thank Edmondson. I hope he's here, by the way, and Elizabeth. Uh, I, I don't know whether I last long enough to see him, to hear him speak, but if I do, so much the better. If I don't, please say hello to him. And when COVID is over, I hope to invite him to Kisumu. I'm prepared to buy him a ticket with his wife to come and see us in Kisumu. And we can resume where we left at Cornell last time I was there. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> This is amazing. Yes. Those of you in the audience, you know you have been treated to an amazing run already of brilliance, people with active Pan-African history and connections. Chancellor Green, Governor Nyong'o, thank you so much. And that caution about having another, of not waiting to have another event, I think we will take very seriously. We definitely <laughs> need to do something I agree with you on the question of the sort of the American model of policing, which is actually all over the world now. Um, and you, you're so correct uh, in stating that. So we will yeah. go to Professor Ann Adams, please, next, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you, uh, Carol and Andre, for organizing this, uh, uh, th this event uh, so that we can show off the book. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to do a sequel to my presentation at the symposium, which is what I wrote about. Um, uh, I was interested in, and one of the most important institutional symbols of Pan-Africanism, which is the W.E.B. Du Bois Center for Pan-African Culture in in Ghana. Uh, it's a center that several people on this panel have visited. Um, Loxley came and, uh, and spent about almost a week in Accra and gave lectures and so forth. Um, my paper in the, or my, my, my piece in the book uh, ends in a question mark. It's, is the Du Bois, the du Bois Center a 21st century functioning symbol of Pan-Africanism. And I wanna give somewhat of an answer to that now because uh, just giving a little bit of background context for people in the audience who may not be familiar with it. Uh, the Du Bois Center <clears throat> is, a, uh, is an institution under the Ghana government <clears throat> uh, now under the Ministry of Tourism, I think it was previously under the Ministry of Culture. It is the place, it is the site where uh, Du Bois's own tomb is and, and his, wife's, his wife Shirley's uh, ashes are there as well. Uh, so it is, a, it is a monument under the <clears throat> Ghana government established in 1985. Uh, du Bois had died in 1963, uh, so this is about 20 minutes, 20 years after, uh, after his death. In all of that time, the Ghana government has unfortunately, but perhaps understandably, not been in a position to give the material support that such an institution, uh, a memorial and a research center 
um, uh, uh, has not been able to give it the kind of material support to make it uh, uh, meet the potential that we would expect of it. Um, there were there are many people in Ghana who uh, who never knew who Du Bois was because um, he was brought in by Nkrumah, uh, but shortly after after Du Bois' death, Nkrumah was deposed. And so a whole generation of Ghanaians grew up not having been exposed to Du Bois. And so for this reason, there are many Ghanaians who have no appreciation for the Du Bois Center because they didn't know who Du Bois was. And there are also politicians and others who say about the center in terms of budget and support, well, he was an American, so let the Americans uh, uh, take care of, of the center. And there are even people who, who think that the Du Bois Center is a part of the American embassy. As it happens, they are across the street from each other now anyway. They weren't uh, 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 when I first went there in, in 2005, uh, but uh, or when I first started as director in 2005, they were not across the street from each other, but the, the embassy built a new complex. It is now across the street from the Du Bois Center. And so many people think <clears throat> that uh, they are connected to each other. Now, however, there are Americans who are interested and in the position to, to, uh, uh, to provide that kind of, of support. There is, as of 2019, uh, a foundation called simply the Du Bois Museum Foundation. Uh, a small board that consists of uh, some Ghanaians living in the US as well as some, uh, a couple of white Americans and black Americans. Uh, in general, the board consists of people in the financial world and, and philanth uh, uh, philanthropy and some academics. Uh, they presented a proposal for this, uh, uh, for their, well, I'm gonna read you just the brief statement of of the, uh, the intent of the, uh, of the foundation. It is to develop, rebrand, operate and manage the Du Bois Center to preserve its legacy. Okay, they uh, presented this proposal to, uh, to President Akufuado in 2019, uh, tying it in with the 2019 year of return that, uh, that Ghana uh, promoted uh, in observance of the 400th anniversary, if we have to call it that, of 1619. And uh, uh, so in that year, in 2019, Ghana uh, had a large tourist promotion program to uh, invite uh, uh, diaspora Africans uh, to, uh, uh, to Ghana for that, for that celebration. And so in 2019, they presented uh, th this, Foundation Board presented their proposal to, uh, to the president and to the Minister of Tourism. Um, uh, the president was, was uh, enthusiastic about it. And uh, a few months later, they presented an architectural plan uh, because they intend to expand the physical facility, there is certainly ample space on the grounds for those of you who've been there, uh, expand the physical facility, build a major uh, new building that will hold library and, and events hall and so forth. Uh, they got the plan uh, prepared by no lesser an architect than Sir David Ajay. Uh, the architect, the Ghanaian architect who did, as you recall, the uh, uh, Smithsonian's National uh, Museum for African-American uh, History and Culture. So, uh, so they are on it. Uh, they have a timeline which, uh, under which they intend to be able to begin managing the Du Bois Center in 2023. Uh, that would be the 60th anniversary of Du Bois's death. Now, there are, of course, many 
reservations uh, uh, about Americans taking over the Du Bois Center um, uh, or their, their proposal is to manage it, uh, to, to develop it physically uh, in terms of, of the, uh, the facilities and the program uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, to, uh, to take over the management of it. So um, I have to say, from my perspective, I think the center deserves the kind of attention and support that this, uh, this project is promising. And um, it looks like they are in a position to, to do that. Uh, at the moment, they are finalizing, well, the, uh, an MOU was, was, uh, uh, was signed a few months ago, October of, of last year, I think. And so there are final arrangements uh, in the process, uh, final uh, uh, details in the agreement that the uh, president and the uh, minister of tourism have to, uh, have to agree to and so forth, or that has to be agreed to among all of the, all of the parties. And so uh, under this plan, as of 2023, there will be, uh, if the building is finished, uh, 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 certainly the management and programming in the center will take on a different quality and uh, it will be more like the research and cultural center that one assumes a Du Bois Center in, uh, in Ghana uh, should be. So uh, wow. I just wanted to share Absolutely. this Great development. Wow. I just wanted to share this development with everybody because the piece that I, uh, or when I gave my, my uh, intervention at the symposium, I ended it with uh, uh, a pessimistic, uh, 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 feeling and attitude because of the lack of resources. So now that seems to be uh, uh, resolved and we can look forward to good things happening at the Du Bois Center. Thank wow. you. That is absolutely the best, best news, Professor Adams, my goodness. And Ghana has to be that place. I mean, that's, that's the nation Pan-Africanism. Yeah. Exactly. And exactly. keep in mind, there's also going to be a Pan-African Museum, which has already broken ground and it's been, um, plants and trees are being put in place. So that should be coming up around the same time. So I think Ghana is looking good on this ability to be the center of the Pan-African presentation to the world, right? So I am so pleased to present Nicole Mensa from Switzerland, I believe, but from Ghana. So this is an amazing connection. And when I met Nicole as a student, she told me she went to Pan-African High School in Ghana. So this is an amazing extension. And I was pleased that she was one of my students and able to talk about Ya Santewa and Lima Guru. Nicole. Great. I'm having some issues with my camera. I think it says the host has stopped um, camera share or video share, um, okay. but I will Sorry, go ahead. You might please put it on, but you can start in the meantime. Yes, yes. Try to make sure we see you before the end of this event. Perfect, and I'll try, try to- Try it now. I, I redid it, try it now. Oh, ah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. See you. See you. <laughs> there I am. Um, I, I was a little bit nervous going after Professor Adams, but I guess it's only right because she's speaking about my home country. Um, and I guess just as an interesting fact, the Du Bois Center, as you know, has a conference center or conference facility. And my home church in Ghana actually held Sunday services there every week for about six years until two years ago when we moved. So I'm very much looking forward to it getting reconstructed and really living up to the expectation that we all know it can reach. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen very quickly. Professor Davis, I won't take too much time. I promise to do just five minutes. <laughs> okay. 
turn it, it's, it's on. Wow, okay, you got it. Volume, uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So I'm looking at the topic of when women stand up and the stories of Yas Antwa, Lima Boe, and the lessons we can learn. And this is actually the paper I presented four years ago at the Pan-African Symposium. And I guess a few things have changed, but I really want to take the time to thank Professor Boyce Davis, Professor Asilumumba, Professor Tyro, Professor Govogui. I was an Africana Studies major. And truly, I think it changed you know, the course of my life. I'm still young, but it really has impacted me and changed the course of my life. Um, I didn't know that a little, a few months after this presentation in 2017, I would start working and actually work on a book that had to do with women and leadership. Um, and then, be, be where I am now today. So this is me with a few um, what female leaders or you know some from Africa, some from all over the world. And hopefully I will share a few of the lessons that I've learned from them. Okay. Earlier this morning, before I, um, as I was working on this presentation, or let me say six weeks ago, I was appointed as the special advisor to the new director general of the World Trade Organization, Ngozi Okonjo-Iwala. She's the first African, she's the first woman, and she's the first black person to ever head the World Trade Organization. Today, I had a coworker come up to me with tears in her eyes, and she said she had worked at the WTO for 13 years. And this period, this time period was the first time that she ever felt she could speak up and she would be listened to because of the appointment of the new DG. And so really thinking about this presentation, it showed me that that is really what it means when women stand up. When women stand up and they stand out, it gives other women, younger and even older women, the opportunity to also speak up and the feeling or you know, the confidence to know that they will also be heard when they speak up. Yeah, Santo's story, and Yeah, Santo is the little lady in the black and white here, um, is one of courage and tenacity. She is, she was a queen mother in the Ashanti region of Ghana in the 1900s. And in 1900, when the, the British were trying to take over the Ashanti kingdom, they were trying to take the golden stool, which is, you know, a pride of the Ashanti kingdom and said to have come from the heavens. And the men were about to give up and let the kingdom be taken away. Yeah, Santua, who was a queen mother there, stood up and said, if the men will not fight, then I will fight because I'm not going to allow this to happen. Today, you know, so many years later, her story is continuously talked about and taught in schools. She laid siege to the fort where the British were living and for several weeks, they were deprived of food and water until, you know, finally they had to call for troops from outside of Ghana to come and help them. In the end, unfortunately, she was captured, but the golden stool remains as a part of the Ashanti kingdom even till today. Lima Bowe, years later, is another woman who I admire. And I say that her story is a story of an army of women standing in white, standing up when no one else would, unafraid because the worst thing imaginable had already happened. She lived through the civil, civil war in Liberia. And in 2002, she became the face of the women's peace movement where they fought and demonstrated and made sure that Liberia would get the peace and dignity that she deserved. I've spoken a little bit about Ngozi okonjo iwala who is my current boss. She was the first fa female finance minister and foreign affairs minister of Nigeria. Um, and now, as I said, the first female of um, director general of the WTO. And I wanted to touch a little bit on Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, who was also the first um, female president of Liberia and took over right after the war. I remember, I guess four or five years ago in Professor Boyce Davis's class where I kind of criticized her for her leadership styles and for being a little bit, I thought too opportunistic. 
But after meeting her and after studying a little bit more about really what it means to be a female leader, I think I've changed my mind. I want to talk, I've, I've spoken a bit about these four women and I want to talk very, very quickly about the things that bring them together. And I guess the challenges and issues that women face as they climb the ladder to leadership or when they reach leadership positions. Christine Lagarde, who is the head of the European Central Bank said, in tense times, call on the woman. When you Google the term, our woman fixes, what we often see is that men are fixers and women are nurturers. But is this exactly true? Research has shown, and in fact, many of women leaders who have been interviewed have shown that they have always been called in when the times were tough. Um, Christine Lagarde said that women often end up in charge to sort things out when everything goes wrong. And out of the four women that I, I'm highlighting today, we see that that was the situation that they faced. Yeah, Santua had to come in when the men refused to go to war for their kingdom. Sir Leif Johnson became the female president after a, a civil war that had destroyed the nation. And even Ngozi Okonjo Iwala as the head of the WTO at a time where trade tensions are extremely high and nobody is sure whether the WTO is going to survive. Um, so I think it's, it's, it is interesting that this is when women are often called to come in and try and fix the situation. Another issue that we find that women face is the issue of likability. I want to highlight first what leadership styles are when it comes to women. When we ask female leaders often how they would describe their leadership styles, many of them say things like inclusive, calm and empathetic, decisive, determined with a spirit of teamwork, consensus, build, consensus building. The former president of Malawi, Joyce Banda said, her leadership style is a love affair. You must fall in love with the people and the people must fall in love with you. And so based on this, we have to ask, do women, and I think especially black women approach leadership differently? Do we focus more on inclusion, on honesty, on purpose, on love of the people versus on compensation? And what effect does this have? And do people realize this? I think the issue of likability is also very interesting because despite leadership styles and the fact that we might focus more on consensus building and all of that, women leaders, especially black women are still less likable than men. In a study done where students took an online class and had to rate their professors online, students who thought, you know, it was, it was a model, so the students couldn't see the professor, but students who thought the professor was female rated her lower than those who thought the professor was male. And often we see this where when women are running for positions of leadership, they are often criticized or said to be disliked. And when you try to point to the exact reason why, the audience often finds it very difficult to say exactly why they don't like them. Um, they are often targeted not just on their intellectual capabilities, but also on appearance, on clothing, on their behavior. And I want to talk a little bit about appearance as well. We see that this is something that is extremely important when it comes to women in leadership. Michelle Obama said that she knew that as a black woman, she was going to be criticized based on what she wore. If she wore something too casual, she would be criticized for being too casual. If she wore something opposite of that, she would be criticized for being too showy and high-end. Chimamanda Adichie in the New York Times article wrote a few years ago that when she came to the US, she felt that if you wanted to be seen as a serious writer, then you couldn't possibly be, look like a person who looks in the mirror, which meant you have to have this disheveled look about you as a woman for people to take you seriously as a writer. Angela Davis, in her piece, Afro Images, Politics, Fashion, and Nostalgia, talked about how disappointed she was for the fact that instead of people to recognize her as a political activist, a leader, and a scholar, she was rather recognized for her Afro hairdo and seen as the woman who was part of the movement with the Afro. Hillary Clinton calculates that she spent a total of over 600 hours or 25 days doing hair and makeup during her campaign. And I, it's amusing because I wonder that if this is her number, then what would the number be for a black woman? And so what have women done to 
to solve this, a lot of them have adopted a uniform. My boss would say she wears her typical African top, top and skirt with a head wrap every single day so that nobody has to worry what she's going to look like or comment on what she looks like because you know what to expect. Likewise, Hillary Clinton said she wears her pantsuit almost all the time so that people know that because in her youth, she spent so much time being criticized for her headbands and everything else. Um, but I think this is something that is, we, should, we really should contemplate because it detracts from, from our leadership, it detracts from the message when women are, you know, are looked at or judged based on their appearances. And these are some articles that I found earlier on. Um, so there are much more topics to, to explore about women in the office um, being attacked and accused of wrongdoings when it's not necessarily, necessarily true or when their male counterparts would do the same thing and not be, not be criticized. Um, women, I, and I think specifically Black women, being judged for showing their emotions, um, being judged as aggressive or incapable if they show any signs of anger or dissatisfaction. Um, and then women also being judged as too emotional or too vulnerable when they show any signs of empathy. Um, further topics, as I said, are balance and can female leaders have it all? And really what Pan-Africanism looks like for Black leaders today or for Black female leaders today. But I want to conclude quickly by saying that women leaders have proven over the years that they are more than capable. And when women stand up, they give other women the voice and the capability to do the same. And I am a product, as I've said, of my professors, of my bosses who have given me that chance. Um, it's complex and it's tough, um, but, and it's often filled with a lot of backlash. Um, but I will end by saying, in the words of Anna Hirsch, who is working with Lindsay, she said, it's about time that we put women into positions of power to allow some of them to fail the way plenty of male leaders are doing. You silence yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, although I am a bit biased and I do think that female leaders are often better than male leaders, I do also think that we should give women the grace to fail and put enough of them into positions where it's, we, are, we don't look at them as having to overperform or to meet all of our expectations and to prove to everybody that women can also do their job. Thank you very much. Wonderful. I am so impressed. When I heard of that WTO appointment, I knew you were going to be called. I am so impressed. She was my TA and she helped the students loved her when we did the Black Women and Political Leadership. So I have to let them know that you doing exactly what we thought you would. And she's going to be a future female leader for sure. And she already is on that pathway. So congrats, Nicole, and keep in touch and we love you. So we go to Professor Mippelman now, please, if you don't mind. Yes. Well, th thanks very much to uh, Professor Carol uh, Boyce Davies and to Professor Lomoba, uh, the Africana Center and Cornell University, which is my alma mater and was my, uh, uh, my first academic job was as a member of the faculty at Cornell University. Uh, I was there at a special time when the Africana Center was struggling to get established. And I think a special shout out should go to uh, Jim Turner uh, for his role in this. Indeed, it was a very, very difficult time. And he was an inspiration and a tower of strength uh, for those of us who were in Ithaca then. Uh, and special thanks, of course, to Loxley Edmondson. Uh, I was his mentee. Uh, he was my MA supervisor at the University of East Africa, as it was called at the time. I'll come back to that in just a minute. We met 52 years ago, a very long time ago, uh, when I was uh, enrolled at the university for an MA degree. And I will never recover from my good fortune uh, from that period. The University of East Africa was a Pan-African university. 
this was uh, the embodiment of a Pan-African con uh, uh, connection. There were three branches, uh, Makeri in Kampala, Nairobi, and Dar es Salaam. Uh, the context is important. Uh, this, the late 1960s was the time of black power, uh, the anti-war movement of liberation struggles in Southern Africa, uh, of urban riots, and a great deal of turmoil on universities. Uh, we looked to Ethiopia at the time where courageous students and members of academic staff were struggling against the emperor. Uh, the University of East Africa was also a place of intellectual ferment. Uh, Ngugi Wathiongo was there. He had studied at Makeri University, and then he uh, became a member of academic staff at the University of Nairobi. Uh, there was Walter Rodney uh, in, in Dar es Salaam, uh, Ali Mazrui with us in Kampala, Many great writers, Okat Batek, uh, David Rubadiri from Malawi, uh, and many others. It was the time when Johan Galtung was with us from Norway. Uh, I was his student. Uh, that was the time when Johan Galtung was uh, uh, the founder of Peace Studies. Uh, uh, the fellow students uh, included uh, Peter Niang Ogongo, uh, Peter was the president of the Student Guild at McCary, the first non-Ugandan who was president of the Student Guild. Uh, there were visitors who came to the campus, such as Julius Neary, Kenneth Kaunda. It was a time of tremendous uh, ferment, uh, and, uh, and this was when I arrived on the campus. Uh, Loxley Edmondson, or Eddie, as we all called him at the time, took me under his wing. Uh, and together, uh, not in a course, but just through our own association, our, our, our collegiality with one another, our friendship, we read the great Pan-African uh, uh, thinkers. Uh, together, we read Edward Blyden, uh, Casely Hayford, George Padmore, Henry Sylvester Williams, and many others. We debated, we discussed, uh, and Pan-Africanism in these great thinkers have always been central to the, to the writing and to the teaching of Loxley Edmondson. Uh, for Loxley at the time when I was reading with him and then when he supervised my MA, uh, viewed Pan-Africanism as a series of concentric circles. There was national Pan-Africanism, regional Pan-Africanism, and global Pan-Africanism. And the matrix became more complicated with political dimensions and economic dimensions and cultural dimensions to Pan-Africanism. Uh, another central chord in this dynamic uh, was race. Uh, race was always there. It was an ideology, an ideology of uh, them and us, we and they. Today, what uh, social scientists call othering. Uh, and it, uh, uh, there was a, co a comparative dimension as well. The com comparative dimension came in historically in terms of different types of systems of, uh, of slavery. So uh, Loxley was writing about intersectionality before the term was introduced. He was writing about anti-racism long, long ago. His critical acts uh, always fell on the dynamics of marginalization and of intolerance. These were the themes that were running through uh, Loxley's mind, the discussions that we had during that, that period. Uh, I remember I read draft after draft of the article. It became very well known 
in Mawazo, the journal Mawazo, uh, published in East Africa uh, at the time. Uh, and this was uh, uh, Oxley wrote copiously uh, improving and improving his manuscripts. In fact, he never let me up from writing that MA thesis. I got reams and reams of comments. So in conclusion, uh, I want to say that I'm grateful to Loxley for his meticulous scholarship, his warm generosity, uh, his infectious sense of humor, and being my brother. In fact, the Edmondson family even invited me to stay at their house when I returned from Kampala to Ithaca, New York. I did not have a place to live. I stayed for a very long time with the Edmondsons uh, and uh, I may have even overstayed my welcome, but I was made to feel like a family member. That is a Pan-African connection, one for which I'm ever grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mittelma. And thank you so much. And I, I'm so proud of your work and your continuing um, ability to bring those early connections forward. And now it's my pleasure again to present, I think perhaps the second PhD in Africana, maybe second, if not second, third, but I believe second, Dr. Kanye Sola Obayan. She is a Mellon postdoc fellow now in digital humanities at MIT. Uh, and she works on the question of it's the intersections of Africana studies with digital humanities. So she's in one of those areas that, that you can tell is going to really be what uh, defines uh, some of our fields in the future. Uh, from Nigeria, but she does an amazing uh, public facing organizational um, uh, project called Orison Collective as well. And I'm really another student of mine, I'm really happy to present uh, Kanye Sula, who presented at the conference as well, and will summarize a paper. Kanye. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. It's, <laughs> it's indeed a pleasure. Thank you to Dr. Cowboy Davies. So many familiar faces here. Um, um, Professor Indri, so nice to see you again. And Professor Ann Adams, and obviously my my uncle, <laughs> Professor Femi Taiwo, <laughs> my uncle from Ibadan, <laughs> and obviously um, Dr. Edmondson, my jovial father figure. I can still remember his laugh in the um, Africana Center. So it's a pleasure to be here, and obviously Nicole, what a fantastic job! So happy to be here. Um, on Zoom, um, I'm excited hopefully one day to visit in person. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be just reflecting on what I wrote on because I had to go back and read it. I was like, what did I write on it? <laughs> so many years ago. <laughs> and I'm glad that you know this um, symposium was convened and this edited volume has come out now. So much has happened, so much has happened even just over this past one year and so much is happening. Um, and I was writing on Afropolitanism um, because it's one of the term, um, and the reason why I decided to write on that was because it's oftentimes juxtaposed with Pan-Africanism and a lot of scholars, like we have late, the late B.M. Van Gawena um, saying very um, declaratively that he's a Pan-Africanist, not an Afropolitan. So I was very curious, um, I think for the past, it's been a long time since I've been engaging with this concept and um, about, what are the possibilities of this terminology and where, where can it take us and how does it relate to the other um, intellectual traditions and political movements that have taken place um, over time in the black you know, radical tradition. Um, and as I was preparing for this time, I was just reflecting on how much my thinking on the term has evolved over time. Um, just to, um, to give a, just a little definition for those who aren't familiar with Afropolitanism, it is for it's it refers to how Africans see themselves as being a part of the world rather than being apart from it. Um, so it's just really an exercise in African worldliness. Um, whereas Pan Africanism, as we all know, is a political movement and ideology grounded in racial solidarity. Um, so I was very, very critical of Afropolitanism and because I had issues with his classist undertones and lack of serious political engagements with race and, race and blackness as a category. But now I'm a little bit, I, I'm not, 
I think I'm still a little bit critical of it, but I'm more um, more sympathetic to it because I think after many years of theorizing and actually doing some grounded um, ethnographic work with these would-be Afropolitans <laughs> who don't call themselves that, they just call themselves Africans. So I think I now, I understand a little bit more about it. And I guess some people would consider me to be an Afropolitan, but I don't consider myself to be such. I just, I think, I think African is capacious enough for all those things um, and as it should be. But um, I think that many individuals that I engage with probably do not consider themselves to be that, although they might fit this description, but they also consider themselves to be Pan-Africans as well, because they're also very rooted in the issue of race and racial justice. Um, I think a case in point would be someone like Opal Tometi, who is one of the founders of the BLM movement, but she occupies this kind of hybrid identity of being a Nigerian American, but she's also very committed to racial justice. So um, I think this is the case of theory lagging behind practice as always. I think these concepts are not mutually exclusive and in essence, they work very well together. I think we live in a world of uh, where we see a lot happening with the recent case of um, George Floyd's um, um, victory that was won. And we see um, the BLM movement taking on this global shape. And it's coming at the also at the same time where there's this cultural kind of renaissance of blackness. And I think that these, um, th these two processes are working together. Um, so, but I think what has happened and why there's been this disparate history is kind of taking place and people pitting the two against is that there's a lack of intellectual and conceptual history. Um, I think when we historically examine um, the notion of Afropolitanism and actually look at the actual practices, we'll see that the actual practices of Afropolitanism predates the terminology. Uh, I mean, you only need to look, study 19th century political movements, Black radical traditions, the histories of diaspora, African nationalism, and even Pan-Africanism itself to see that many of the leaders and thinkers of these movements were <laughs> probably Afropolitans. Um, and their desire for a global humanism and worldliness did not negate the categorical importance of race or nationhood. I think it's quite reductive for us to think of, um, and I'm speaking from the category of people, of, of Afropolitans or people, scholars who work on Afropolitans that are critiquing Pan-Africanism. I think it's very reductive to um, kind of think of it just as a race-based concept. Um, it is more capacious than what people actually think, especially when we view it in the context of diaspora. I think um, diaspora, um, it was always kind of defined beyond blackness. It was it, it um, encapsulated geography, language, nations um, across the world. Um, and it was always already kind of worldly. Um, it has always been engaged with the world. So that being said, I am not negating the existence of um, racial essentialism, okay. which, oh, sorry. Oh, with that being said, I'm not negating the existence of racial essentialism and black national discourse, which is really the, um, critique that a lot of um, um, Afropolitan um, people who favor Afropolitanism say about Pan-Africanism because of the racial essentialism. Um, I'm, not I'm not negating the existence of that, but I'm saying it's just reductive for us to apply that terminology to the deeply complex and multi-dimensional histories, practices, and cultures that occurred under the moniker of Pan-Africanism. Um, I'm also thinking, I'm also saying that it's important that we are cautious when we're talking about this notion of post-race, especially in an era where race is still very palpable and it's such a powerful construct. Um, what I think that both of these terminologies would benefit from as we try to work with them in tandem is more grounded study, um, a deep historical um, study and ethnographic study of grounded lived realities of Africans will kind of bridge the gap between these two. Um, we'll get to see that there's a lot of Afropolitanism in Pan-Africanism and vice versa. Um, so I'm going to rest my case on that. Um, I just was kind of reflecting over what I wrote and the transformation of my thinking over time. And I continue to um, work on the concept and um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to see some new possibilities that can emerge as I explore these concepts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Edmonton. Thank you, Katya. Thank you my uncles and my, and my mentors. <laughs> I am so proud of you, girl. Oh, wow. I love these girls. Okay. I love them madly.
Horace Campbell. I am so, yeah, yeah, I love you with that white hair. I'm sorry. I didn't say it right the first time. I'm loving it. And I mean, we're coming, those of you who are hanging with us online, this, you all getting an expert coming right up. So get ready. I'm telling you, I'm warning you, I'm pre-warning you. This is Horace Campbell, Rasta and Resistance, Pan-Africanist, attended several of the events of Pan-Africanist conferences that I knew about. So you're getting it from the from the horse's mouth, as they say. Ars Campbell, I love you too, and friend from a long time, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, as Ann Adams started out, we are in upstate New York. So we're sending greetings to all our brothers and sisters in all parts of this planet. And, and we want to thank the organizers who have done their work in ensuring that the journey of um, our brother is not um, forgotten, Sister Injury and um, Carol and those who worked with them. I made a few statements about um, that Loxley, who is an elder, and I started out talking about my grounding with Loxley in Vietnam um, in, 90, in 2010, or 11 years ago. And for me, um, the Vietnamese um, experience remains important within the context of Bandung and how the Vietnamese made tremendous sacrifices for the independence of colonized territories by defeating France and defeating the United States of America. But the memory of the people of the United States of America is so limited that the United States of America in their national security establishment is seeking to mobilize the Vietnamese against the Chinese, not knowing much about history. But our time in Vietnam reinforced to me the relationship between Bandung Project and Pan-Africanism, because the Bandung Project um, um, and the Pan-African Project um, were part of the same process fighting for bread, peace, and justice. And as an anti-colonial project, there are many who discuss Pan-Africanism without reference to the reality that some of the limited objectives of the Pan-African movement have not been achieved. And these limited objectives remain the question of independence, political independence, that is, in countries such as the Western Sahara, in Cayenne, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Puerto Rico, um, Western Sahara, um, Mayotte, Quetta. And what has happened in the academy is that the discussion of Pan-Africanism and even within the African Union has been oriented in a way in which there is no discussion on the question of anti-colonial struggles that are still going on. So we have many discussions about the Pan-African connections and there's very little solidarity with countries like Vietnam or with the countries that are still fighting for um, freedom. So this is the context of my memory of, um, of um, Loxley Edmondson. Of course, in my um, memory, because I come from the same society as Loxley, so I feel and understand the class base of the society that he came from. So well, Loxley has been navigating this journey that is the essence of Pan-Africanism, is how can one achieve dignity as a human being, which is the essence of what the Pan-African movement and the Pan-African connection is about. And the question, as someone coming out of Jamaican society, is that the society was not organized in its reproduction of capital and reproduction of human beings for Africans to have dignity. So the African people is in Jamaica have always in, has been at the foundation of the struggle for the definition of themselves as human beings. And Loxley, like all of us, we started from some deficit 
he was a man, he was in a colonial society, and he was defined as being so, um, inferior. To add it to that, Loxley Edmondson, in his youth, had to survive an institution called Jamaica College. Jamaica College is a high school in Jamaica, which is physical in Jamaica, but intellectual and ideological is against the Jamaican people. And Loxley Edmondson um, survived that. Um, we don't know um, um, what damage it has done to him because none told us that all of us who come out of the colonial context have a certain kind of damages done to us. So the, the challenge that Loxley and all of us face in this Pan-African connection is how can one be true to the process of enhancing dignity in institutions like Jamaica College? a high school which is designed to alienate Black people from their surroundings and to alienate colonized people from fighting for dignity and to alienate them from having solidarity with those in Cuba or Venezuela or elsewhere. And so, uh, so Loxley Edmondson had to navigate. And in this navigation, he had to turn to the Jamaican working peoples. And as Yusuf Kwaena said in Pan-Africanism, that in this navigation, one has to be wrestling with how does one respond to Babylon, which is a popular term for imperialism, and the people's response for dignity. And so therefore, an intellectual such as um, Lux Edmondson would have to be navigating the intellectual, um, um, the intellectual um, traps for a black person who want to develop as a human being. So this is um, what I try to communicate in looking at Loxley Edmondson and looking at him in comparison to some of um, his peers, such as um, Orlando Patterson or Hugh Small or Stuart Hall or um, others who came through this institution that is called Jamaica College. And one day that the history of the damage that that institution has done to the um, Jamaican society will be recorded. So um, Lossel Edmondson in his navigation has had to do what many Jamaican workers and small farmers had to do, navigate from position of traversing the world. And Jim Smittleman and Peter Nyang Nong has spoke about that navigation in the context of Makere. Um, Loxley navigated within the context of the Jamaican societies in the early 70s. And in that navigation, he came face to face with those who articulated a project for the Jamaican people, a project which was not in sync with the Pan-African desire for freedom and dignity. And those um, persons then critiqued Loxley Edmondson because he did not willy-nilly um, become a psychophant to ideas that came from other parts of the world. These are still important challenges for an African -Hitting. So uh, uh, Loxley's been bobbing and weaving, navigating oh, Makere, Mona, um, uh, and um, at, at Cornell in Ithaca. And, and the challenge that he faced, that we all face, is can Pan-African ideas develop or thrive within institutions such as these? Uh, Loxley has, has shown that what you can do is you can do your best in these institutions because by their very nature, the institutions and the eugenics ideas that are reproduced in these um, institutions are not there for the refinement of the ideas of dignity of African persons. So Pan-Africanism would be reoriented in ways which talks about Pan-African tourism or an African, um, Pan-Africanism based on skin color without any sense of dealing with the essence of what people are fighting for. So let me conclude by saying that we're back to the Bandung process. COVID has brought um, 
humanity face to face with the delegitimization of the ideas of individualism, private property, and commodity fetishism. And the Pan-African movement are, is faced with this idea. But in the midst of this, the, 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 the youth who want to assert their humanity, the youth in this conjuncture have risen up to reject the ideas that comes out of the academy that even while speaking the name of, 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 of Pan-Africanism, want to isolate thinkers who want to develop the ideas further. So it is the Black Lives Matter and the youth that is fertilizing the new direction in scholarship for repairing the planet Earth and repairing human beings. And I can say that in the context of my own work in the past six months, has been working with the International Commission Inquiry into police killings against Black people in the United States of America. And that International Commission for Inquiry, it, they, it will be rolled out tomorrow in an international press conference. But all of the 44 cases that we heard of the police killings of Black people in the United States of America um, brought graphic evidence of how whiteness and capitalism are intertwined into racial capitalism, and there can be no future for Pan-Africanism without an anti-capitalist um, focus. So the International Commission of Inquiry into Police Violence in the United States of America has brought the question of reparative justice back to the center of the discussion, something that has always been there for the Pan-African movement. So I would want to salute um, um, Loxley to say congratulations on remaining healthy as a human being after your navigation for all these years. And may you be around in this conjuncture as a youth explode the facade of democracy and freedom in the process of trying to create a space where humans can thrive. Wow, thank you, Harris Campbell. If you can, Harris, can you give us that link for that Commission of Inquiry? Because that is really, really, really important. The International um, Commission of Inquiry into Police Violence Against um, African Americans. It is okay. by the, it, it is, it, 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 the, the launch is tomorrow. I can send it to you by email when this is finished. Sure. Um, but this, this um, the, the findings, we are hoping that institutions such as Cornell, the Black Law students will join internationally in bringing the United States before the International Criminal Court of Crimes Against Black People in the United States of America. Right. And keep in mind, we've had, you know, this is a really amazing international replay of recharge genocide from the That's right. That's right. I'm looking forward to reading it and I'm going to try to stay on top of that. So I am so, thank you, Aris. Again, um, it's always a pleasure hearing your know, ideas and, and your politics and your praxis and your activist, activism. And I'm really um, pleased that you took time to be with us today and that you contributed to this event. So, you know, I have to say this before I introduce my colleague, Gendry Asi Lumumba. This is the first, our book is the first major project, collaborative project uh, of the Africana Center in this or in this um, iteration, and I have to say that it's done by two women. Following um, Nicole's um, interesting point, when women stand up, uh, because we stand up all the time, and of course we get in trouble, but we keep going. We will keep speaking. So I am really pleased that my colleague and I, Andrea Silamuba, collaborated on this project. It's been a joy working with her and chatting with her and staying connected. Thank you, Andrea. Please go forward. Okay, thank you. And uh, I know time is. Uh, on, do you hear me? Yes. And do you see my uh, PowerPoint? Yes, I see everything. Okay. Go to slideshow yeah. so we can yeah. see it for I'm, yeah. I'm going to go fast because time is up. Uh, but I would like to take the Kanisola's last uh, comment calling for more historical work and uh, for us, uh, wor uh, work on um, the youth. So there's a convergence of, of those two. And uh, I, in this uh, particular contribution, I focus on a student of global Africa and Pan-African consciousness. 
and the engagement of these young people. And many people that we know as an icon. Uh, I gave a talk at UNESCO two years ago. I mentioned they were very young, in fact, when you look at uh, the trajectory of all those people. So uh, what I do here, and I'm going to just focus on a few comments, uh, hoping that when uh, you have the book, you will be able to read it. I talk about the meeting of uh, uh, students of the African continent and the African diaspora, particularly from the Caribbean meeting on the European soil and what they were able to do. Uh, again, because of lack of time, I'm going to go quickly. I focus uh, on the um, so-called Francophone countries because there was a lot of work that was done in the diaspora, uh, uh, in the Pan-African uh, framework and also globally that is less known because of uh, that uh, uh, historical connection to the French uh, uh, colonial system. But it started here, the first group of students in Europe who met was, were those from the Caribbean and those from the countries that were at the time colonized by, uh, by Great Britain, uh, namely, uh, uh, Sylvester, uh, uh, Henry Sylvester William, and all those students from um, Ghana, the Gambia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone. Um, but let me go quickly here and uh, mention that in the 1950s, after World War II, uh, students organized more systematically uh, in the fight for, um, to end colonization. And ironically, many, the few of the students who were able to go to Europe to study uh, found themselves while they were at the center in the heart of the colonial empire, they were able to articulate, organize and articulate their struggle for to end uh, colonization. Um, here, I refer to a few of the first student organizations that uh, were put together. Uh, there was one Association des Étudiants Musulmans d'Afrique du Nord, Association of uh, Muslim Students of North Africa. And North Africa was mostly dominated by the French, uh, which after uh, uh, later on was transformed into Association of North African Muslim Students. Uh, and then of uh, the major student organization at the time, and they were all articulating the same quest for independence, for freedom. Uh, there was this um, West African Student Association, WASU, uh, which was mostly from former British colonies. And then I would like to uh, focus on the, uh, on the uh, Francophone part, uh, the, uh, there were also those organizations, uh, groups that were formed by countries that were formerly colonized by the Portuguese, uh, particularly Amerika Cabral. Uh, they were all studied in, uh, in, um, in Europe, particularly, again, the contradiction is they studied in the colonial uh, empire and were able to articulate more forcefully their, their uh, their quest for independence. There were a few exceptions, such as Mondelan, who studied right near here, uh, Horace, uh, in, uh, in uh, Syracuse. Um, the, um, the, the group that I, I, I chose to focus on uh, formed this uh, Federation of Students from Black Africa in France, Fédération des étudiants d'Afrique Noire en France. And they articulated clearly their position, although there were two positions. There was a wing that was more nationalistic because they wanted to focus specifically on for freedom of African people on the continent. But there's a second uh, uh, wing that was the most powerful, the most forceful, that second wing was influenced more directly by the French Communist uh, Party. 
and was radical and universalistic in its message of liberation of freedom. So they took a specific position regarding uh, broad issues of the time based on whether they were part of uh, the group one or the group more international uh, 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 brand. And they started to publish. Uh, they didn't have the internet at the time, but they realized that it was very important to go outside of the small circles to make those ideas known by others. So they started to publish. La Voix de l'Afrique Noire, the voice of Black Africa was one of them. And one of the iconic figures uh, was, uh, uh, was later known was Sheikh Anta Diop, who was one of the most active members of that second more universalistic uh, 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 group. So they created all these um, uh, uh, possibilities of communicating their, their ideas. They published, for instance, Ver une idéologie de l'Afrique noire toward an ideology of Black Africa. Uh, in this uh, article, they pointed out the importance of creating a Pan-African continental state with a connection to the diaspora. So um, and, and the other publication they brought out at that time was La Lutte en Afrique Noire, the struggle in Black Africa. So the point I'm making here is that they were very serious, they were very well organized, and with the motto of integration to the masses. And the argument is that you cannot find any, you would not find any excuse of saying that the African masses are back home and therefore I cannot uh, integrate the masses. Wherever you are, you integrate the masses where you are uh, operating from. So these are some of the work that the, they did. The French colonies, uh, included for, for, uh, 14 sections. And those 14 sections uh, organized to have um, the, the student in France, in Europe, organized to have section in their respective countries, which of course was very worrisome for the colonial empire because you can organize uh, in France, uh, people are protesting anyway all the time. So you're part of it. But when these organizations go back home and join all the group that had been fighting colonization uh, for uh, since the very beginning, it became very much uh, a, a source of, uh, uh, of concern for the French colonial empire. So um, I know it's already time passed. So I want to really focus here on the important work that they did. Many of the presidents uh, later on, some of them changed their political um, uh, ideology, but many Africans who became uh, leaders in their respective countries had the FEAF as a training ground. A few of them remained very radical to the end or are still, many are still alive. Uh, so the FEAF played that major role of training the Africans leadership and, and taking a courageous position when it came to the colonial uh, 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 politics of, of, the, of the French. Um, well, let me end because of uh, uh, the lack of uh, time. Uh, they took a strong position on les étudiants africains et l'unité africaine. They were very adamant about the African unity. Um, so one of the specific and major issues that they were debating included Pan-Africanism, incorporating Blacks on the continent and the African diaspora only. So you see, moving from the continent to the Black people in the diaspora, and the second, was a more radical position integrating the struggle of all the people who are uh, exploited and oppressed. And going back to the presentation by Horace, uh, the Bandung framework was very much important in, in, that, uh, in that group. So um, I would like to then end it here and uh, uh, move to, uh, to conclude to the concluding 
uh, section of the book where I, um, in the last part, I wrote a few years ago during a nice dinner at which uh, my husband and I were invited at the home of Professor uh, and uh, Sister Elizabeth Edmondson, while Dorothy Cotton, uh, one of the uh, an iconic figures, was still working on her seminal book, we had the privilege of hearing her discuss possible titles, including the one from uh, the inspiring word of Martin Luther King, that uh, she was uh, ultimately, uh, she ultimately decided to use that title. If you back, uh, if you backs not bent, the role of citizenship education program in the civil rights movement. So this is a call to all that the system will be always there, fighting, making sure to discourage, making sure to lower your expectation, making sure to divide. But unless you allow the system to work all over you, it will not work. So when I read, uh, some of you may know, I'm uh, also a trained historian beside my uh, being a sociologist and uh, educator. Uh, when I read, what I'm fascinated by is the daunting task at that time when young students with the, the powerful, uh, terrible global uh, 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 colonial system, how they were able to have that courage, that sense of purpose, that sense of history, and took their place and played their role when they were still very young. So uh, I would like to uh, end here by thanking all of you. It's a wonderful opportunity. And let me take uh, also this uh, 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 moment to say that we have more books. Uh, uh, we are very, very fortunate that Professor Edmondson is here to hear us celebrating his, uh, his life and uh, expressing our gratitude for having been associated with him. There are other book projects that are about people who are no longer with us, but they, are, they have joined the world of the ancestors and can see us. There was uh, a, a, a meeting, a conference, Professor Edmondson and I organized uh, when Professor Mazuri passed away. So we still hope that with the inspiration of this book, we will be able to call upon all of you to contribute so that we can gather again around one book to have a such conversation. So I thank you and uh, Carol, it was a pleasure working and I want to thank each contributor and I want to reiterate my appreciation for Eric. He played a major role from the very beginning and I want to take the opportunity to thank also uh, our brother, Kasahun, who uh, Chikole of uh, Africa World Press for giving us the platform to, uh, uh, to make some of our thoughts, our experiences known. So back to you, Carol. Thank you, Andre. So again, um, it's my pleasure to thank um, Chancellor Eddie Green, Professor Governor Anya Nyong'o, Professor Ann Adams, uh, Ms. Nicole Benser, Professor Mittelman, Dr. Kanyan, Kanyan Sola Obayan, Professor Harris Campbell, Professor Indri Asiela Mumba. And what we will do is go directly to um, Professor Edmondson for a response because what we want you to do in the interim is if you have questions that you want to raise directly with the panelists, please put them in the chat and I will read as many of them as possible and get people to answer before we close off the evening. So I'm going to go directly to Professor Edmondson. Loxley, we want to hear you. We miss you and we want to hear your voice. This is an unexpected treat, especially at this time of year where not many treats are going around. <laughs> but be that as it may, um, I very much appreciate um, some of the words I've heard. Um, I'm not questioning any, but I just want to make a few comments in passing. Um, I really 
feel very elevated that you have decided to move along with this publication. Thank you so much, um, Indri and Carol and whoever. But I want to say a few words. First of all, I want to tell Peter and Yang, right? That he is quite right. I used to come to class with my pocket full of cigarettes, <laughs> but I, ga I gave those up at least two decades ago, if not more. Right now, I can't go near a cigarette. I feel sick. So just let you know that my health, therefore, is holding much better than it would have otherwise. Um, I was born in Jamaica, um, a country which was colonized by Britain for 307 years. Um, went through high school there, as Horace said, a place called Jamaica College. It was regarded as a very prestigious school boarding school and all a lot. But having said that, though, um, the syllabuses were set in Britain. We wrote our exams. They were graded in Britain, whatnot. But I can speak for myself. One thing my experience there taught me was how to question knowledge, so-called knowledge. We had English teachers. And when I heard them say some things which didn't make sense to me, I never hesitated to question them in a very polite way and so forth. So at least it gave me, but at least two, I also benefited from learning quite a lot of European history, which as a product of colonialism to understand the impact of colonialism and co-colonialism, one has to have some knowledge of what went on before. So much for that. Um, after finishing my high school in Jamaica, I suppose I was <laughs> a good colonial subject. I decided to go to Britain for my undergrad studies. I went to the University of Birmingham in 1957. Um, I wanted to read economics, but I saw they had a degree called Econ EPS, Economics, Politics, Sociology. So I opted for that. And that's what I majored in, um, a three-year degree, which I completed there. And the British experience in some ways at the university or beyond the university too, started leading me more and more onto the issue of race. It was in Britain that I ran into racism head on first time. Um, I remember a summer job I had, it was as a gardener one of the best jobs I ever had, I lost weight and this and that. But the head gardener, Englishman, came up with me and said, I know they call people like you Negroes, but I'm going to call you darky. <laughs> now that was the opening wow. ceremony, so to speak. I remember having a summer job at a very prestigious factory, it's a glass factory, and going in for lunch, everybody's eating. And the minute I walked in, Dead silence. I won't forget it to this day. <laughs> and um, one of the guys came to sit at my table. He said, what's your name, mate? I told him, what are you doing here? The English wasn't too good um, and so forth. Anyway, I went on and said, I'm doing a degree at the university. Suppose you file your exams. I said to him, I never failed exams. He said, you are arrogant. I said, no, I'm being truthful. So is this type of thing, a negotiating turf you're getting to see. And then you go to the newspapers now. Um, my fiance came up to join me there to get an apartment was hell. No Jamaicans lead apply. No blacks lead apply. It was that, it was brutally crude and in your face. So right away, the racist environment starts to bring ideas to you what is happening and so forth and so forth. So much for that part of it. Now, on the more positive end, two things I realized in which I benefited from. I lived in a hostel called Methodist International House, mostly for foreigners. For the first time in my life, I met Africans from Africa, African students. And this was 1950s. I realize it now, at the time when decolonization was taking place. And so from here now, I suddenly I'm getting much more aware of the anti-colonial struggle 
in various parts of Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, et cetera, and other parts of the Caribbean too, and so forth. So this too, on reflection, um, did give me some good information and interest that, uh, anyway, in one of my classes, before I graduated, the professor came in one day, I won't forget this, it was a seminar. He said, um, I have a list of research topics here for the class, 17 of us in the class, pick one. So I got the list and the first topic I saw was the American Negro. And I said, that's my topic, sir. And my life was changed permanently since. That's when I started reading everything I could about the condition of African-Americans here, the brutality of American racism, which is still around with us today in various forms and so forth. So I look back on reflection, it really made so, so much so that when I then decided to do my graduate work in Canada, and when I went there, I decided with the encouragement of a professor, he heard me talk a lot about race, to do something about the African-American situation. So I used to travel to the States every summer to do research. My first topic for my PhD thesis was the politics of the NAACP, which I started, but I didn't complete. I changed it to something else later. But I went across the border and I interviewed. I was very fortunate. Um, Roy Wilkins was then the head of the NAACP. I interviewed him. I interviewed Thurgood Marshall, believe it or no, for this thing. I remember now, I don't know if I made the right decision, yeah, decision being invited by somebody who was hanging around the NAACP office and knowing of my interest said, you know, I know Du Bois very well. Would you like me to, you know, introduce you to him? But he went on to say Du Bois, it has, was before Du Bois left for Africa, but he wasn't well. He said, he's not well. And I made my decision there. I said, I'd love to meet him, but if he's not well, I really don't want to, you know, impose on him. So I gave up that opportunity. But it was there now that the American part of race came into play with a Caribbean background, um, so forth, and with the experience in the United States, um, I then decided to do my PhD thesis, first on the NACP, but after a while, I lost some interest in it, although it helped me a lot to pick up information about racism. I changed the topic um, to race, politics, and the international system, aspects of research and behavior. And it is in 1973, I completed a, a 720 page PhD thesis, which I still have, it's heavy like, <laughs> I don't know what. Anyway, having said that, let's go there. But okay, so I continued my studies in Canada. Um, I then got my first job at the university in Canada, University of Waterloo. I went to a conference, American Political Science Association in New York City, one of those one in one year. And there, I remember getting up one morning and seeing three or four black men sitting at a table. So I gravitated over and they started introducing themselves. And one of them said, my name is Ali Mazrui. Now it's a name, the, me, the, some of the current younger generation may not know well, but check it out, M-A-Z or Z as you call it, R-U-I. He was an icon in the study of African politics. He, he, he just wrote books like nobody's business. So I sat at the table, they said, sure, come and join us. Um, 
when I was leaving after breakfast, he said to me, I told him what I was doing. I was teaching in, in Canada, what courses I was teaching. He said, um, would you have dinner with me tonight? I said, sure, a free, free dinner. So we started talking. So he went on to ask questions about me. Um, one thing he said, for example, he said, what courses are you teaching? What's interest in your research? Have you ever been to Africa? I said, never, I would love to come. He said, well, I said, why do you ask? He said, I'm chair of my department. I have a vacancy there and I think you are the person to fill it. I won't forget. I said, you have to be joking. He said, I wasn't joking. I was interviewing you. I said, how would I know? He said, well, I was. And I think you are the person I would like. If I get the money to bring you there, will you come? Within six months, I was on my way to Africa. So that's where my African sojourn now began when I went to McCarrera University. It was part of the University of East Africa, as you have been told before, one branch in Nairobi, one in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, the third one in Kampala in Uganda. Um, this. So there it was. So I spent maybe five years at the university at Macquarie, that's where I met Peter. For example, that's where Mittelman met me. And it was a total transformation. Um, for the first time I began seriously learning more about Africa as one should. They didn't bring me there to teach about Africa. I taught courses on European politics, um, political parties. So anyway, so that's part of that. But having said that, that was a good start. One thing I realized now, I was very lucky, I almost once suffered, if I may say so, almost suffered once because of being with my, with my Caribbean ancestry not being known by a group of soldiers who one night, 1960 or so, there was an, an attempted assassination of the then president of Uganda, Milton Obote. He was shot, he was shunted out to the hospital. I happened to be out that night coming from somebody's home, me and my then wife, and the streets were packed with soldiers, with guns and whatnot, and they were taking people out of their cars and searching cars. So I got out, I put my hands up, they started searching my car. They started asking me questions. They assumed I was African, of course, and I was trying to tell them, I don't understand the language. I'm not from Uganda. Where are you from? One of them said to me, I said, Jamaica. He said to me, in Jamaica, they speak Swahili. You know, this was a Pan-African. <laughs> but I, I ran across up to them. I can't forget it. But having said that, anyway, I, I managed to survive. The last. They killed over 50 people that night. It was very serious and so forth. But uh, right after that, I left Uganda and went to Canada. Um, went to the United States. In fact, in fact, Cornell offered me a job there because I had started writing about race in international politics and so forth. So much for that particular background. But um, as I said, I was glad that I could meet students from Africa for the first time in Britain, um, some in Canada too, and was close enough to the United States that I could go across the border to do research. So that is where my beginning started. And my PhD thesis was the end result of that. At one stage, when, when the government department invited me for a job, I was contacted by my very dear friend, Professor James Turner, the founding director of Africana, wanting to know if I might be interested in joining Africana because I've been writing about race in international politics at the time. Um, I had to tell him that the government department had grabbed me first, but I came to Cornell, Ithaca, and worked here for a while. Then after a while, I went back to the Caribbean and I came back to Cornell, so much for that. But having said that though, um, with what's going on nowadays, 
Um, part of it is a replay. One thing I find very intriguing is the impact of political presidents, American presidents on race and their impact. I raise this because, for example, in the days of Jim Crow, many students may know that the Democratic Party actually was the racist party. It had a Southern base. Um, so much so, you may check this out, that Franklin Roosevelt, progressive as he was in his New Deal thing, he was very shaky on race relations. Eleanor, his wife, is the one who took it to herself that, to push that area. But if FDR was afraid that if he pushed it too hard, you see the Democrats could lose their leverage in the South. You can understand the politics of it there, but these are as it may. So to understand, going back to FDR's days, race was a factor which counted and he didn't want to touch it at all. New Deal, in spite of the New Deal. Um, Harry Truman, his successor did a much better job. He was the first president to accept an invitation from the NAACP at their annual conference. I remember this from my PhD um, thesis research. Um, and to integrate the American army and so forth. So I'm gonna stop in a moment and just say now, I speak about leaders. You know, Ronald Reagan is one of the heroes of many Americans. How many of you know, many of you may know, but please don't forget, here he is in California and he decides to make a run for the presidency. And he launched his presidency in a town called Philadelphia in Mississippi. This was the town where some of the youth who were protesting racism, a couple of them from were Cornell related were killed. So that's where Reagan went. So just think to yourself, why would he leave California to come to Philadelphia, Mississippi to launch his campaign? And I read later, he also was campaigning with one of the major racists of the times, Trump Thurmond, he was with. So what Reagan, the idol, outright racist. Um, what else can I say? During my sojourn, and I'll end in a moment, in Africa, um, as I said, I taught courses not in Africa. I taught courses on the United States, on Europe, whatever, whatever it was, and so forth. But one of the first articles I wrote was called um, The Internationalization of Black Power, which thanks to Ali Mazrui, I wrote. He said to me one day, he said, Loxley, you know something? He said, you are from the Caribbean. Um, you are now living in Africa. Um, you have studied the African-American situation. You're in a very good position to expose us to what's happening there. And I encourage you very much to take that up as your field of research and writing. So it was then now that I got involved in what I call international race relations. And I was very fortunate for that particular experience. Um, so now years later still, we still see residues of it around. You know, the Antifa is now regarded as an insult. Antifa, somebody against fascism. So, so, so it's regarded, that's something worth critiquing according to <laughs> certain, some of, the Republic, some of the Republican establishment and so forth. So it's important to see to, to study what's happening now and go back to see some of the history of racism in this country and how racism permeated the European and European descent base, those who came to the United States, those who made colonies in Africa, in Asia and whatnot and so forth. So keep enjoying your academic experiences.
and I'm very glad to have shared a little with you at this time. Right? Thank you. Wonderful. Indri. Thank you, Luxi. I love and, that. And you and I thank you so much, Carol and Indri. Thank you so My much neighbor. for thinking yeah, about yeah. me because you know I'm here most of the days, you know, watching TV. And not all TV is nice to watch these days <laughs> and so forth. But right. so it is. Thank Wonderful, you. lastly, thank you. So that's an amazing summary and a lovely, well put together response. And I'm amazed that it was so short, actually. <laughs> I was waiting for the May I just give you two little elements <laughs> that I forgot to mention? Just keep thinking. <laughs> yeah, I um, yeah. Do you remember that okay. Dubois? Dubois. It's just yeah. The boys and Garvey had conflicts. I was just rereading again some of it and so on. Um, du Bois called him some very bad names and so forth. And Garvey too, threw them back. But one thing I found of interest, when Garvey was deported from the United States, Du Bois wrote in the crisis a thing, we wish you well. I look back on that. Deep down, I want to believe that in spite of the coils between them, Du Bois had some respect for Marcus Garvey, who incidentally, some may not know, happens to be my country, Jamaica's first national hero. hero. This only. Thank you. That's beautiful. Hey. Wonderful. Two Pan-Africanists, I wish you well, right? Du Bois, Garvey. So if we, I think it would be nice, we have one comment from, question from the audience. I think I'll raise it to the panelists and see what you want to do with it. But if you have questions for each other, please also feel free to do that or, or question for Professor Edmondson. But the question is, what can white Americans who want to become allies of black and brown people and embark on a journey to become anti-racist do? What should, where should they start? That was a question somebody asked from the chat. That's the one question I see that I can raise. And feel free if you want to ask a question to any of the other speakers or any of the, uh, or Dr. Edmondson as well now, that that's, as I said, doable. We'll do that for a few minutes and then we'll show some images and that sort of thing. I just want to make one comment um, in response to Loxley's very last statement about Du Bois and, and Garvey, uh, just to, uh, to remind Loxley and, and, and others that at the Du Bois Center in Accra, on the, on the grounds, there is a guest house and it is called the Marcus Garvey Guest House. So as we say at the Du Bois Center, if not in life, then in death, they can reside together because they are both well, Garvey is, is not, uh, Garvey's remains are not there, but in any case, uh, you come to the Du Bois Center and you, if you uh, lodge there, you are lodging in, in uh, Garvey's house. So if not in life, then in death, they got together. Thank and you. thank you so much for that comment. I remember when I came to Ghana to your kind invitation, um, that's the first thing I saw that right beside the Du Bois building was the Marcus Garvey hostel. And I said, <laughs> it took death to bring them together. But no, you're quite right on that. Um, that it's, it's, it seems to be a paradox, but I think it's very appropriate because both of them in their independent ways make enormous contributions to the black struggle. And I think that's what Garvey, um, Du Bois recognized it, but he didn't believe in Garvey's tactics. I think that's how I read it. Again, thank you so much. Yeah. Any response to the question? Or oh, feel free to make a statement if, as Anne just did as well. If no in one wants to, if no one wants to answer the question, I could say a few words to the question. So, yeah, please do. May have. I? Yes, please. Well, the constitution of whiteness in the United States of America is a constitution that is very much linked to genocide and genocidal activities. And the challenge in the university today is whether the university will be a place 
to acknowledge genocide, genocidal violence and enslavement. The struggles around the book by Professor Ed Baptiste, the half has never been told, is the resistance inside of the United States of America by academics to accept the role of enslavement of Africans in the transformation of American society. What the present moment has done in the period of COVID, the pandemic of white racism, and the killing of George Floyd is to challenge the university as a whole to come to terms with the question of whiteness and racism in the society and progressive scholars who want to liberate themselves from whiteness, their own development will be linked to the extent to which they're part of an anti-racist project. Thank you, absolutely. Anybody else wants to respond to that question? I think, I, think I, have, I have a feeling. I have a feeling that uh, that white student or whoever he is who really want to connect with the rest of American society in fighting racism should begin by reading Mahmoud Mamdani's book, Neither, neither, neither Native or Neither Set or Native or something like that, which, which deals with the, 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 the backward development democracy in the US, the non-inclusive nature of society, and the historical marginalization of the majority of uh, Americans who are called American Indians. And they were very, very savage confinement to, to what we call a Bantustan, really. What's done about Tustan in the US? Mm -hmm. I think if there is any white American who wants to confront this issue of racism, must confront the history of the US and how the real Americans were marginalized and very brutally confined to these so-called Indian homelands, whatever it is, under very, very inhuman conditions. I mean, you can't have people who are the owners of the land and you marginalize like that and you, you, you think and, and, and you, you argue that you have a democracy. I think Mahmoud Mamdani's book is really an eye opener to this effect to Americans. Thank you for that reference. Anybody else? Very, very important point. Mm -hmm. Pretty important, yeah. And Cornell is, has had to acknowledge it's on indigenous lands, um, the Gagamoni people, which actually is a statement that we read that events earlier, but now. Anybody else question, comment, statement to other panelists? If not, we will go to the images and you can still, Donna, why not do that? And then we can still come back with comments if there are others. Well, before I go to sleep, can I invite Boris Campbell, James Mittelman, and uh, Eddie Edmondson to a meeting of old Macarians at in Kisumu as soon as you can get there. Please, let's be in touch and have an old boys meeting in Kisumu on old Macarians. Peter, there is nothing that I would like better. A young boys meeting, a, 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 a reunion. It would, it would truly be wonderful. Please, uh, please, send, please send the invitation. I would love to connect with other Macarians. Yeah. OK. I'll, do, I'll, ask, I'll ask the organizers to send me the emails in there. And the details of you people because it's a long time, Horace, since we were in touch with each other. And, and I, last, I last met uh, Eddie in Chicago uh, at some uh, third world conference or something like that that Roger Orton organized. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yes. Very much so. We have a meeting of everybody. I don't know. There it is. Specific. Yeah. <laughs> you see? Yes. <laughs> You're keeping memories of oh, the <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's Michelle. Yes. That looks like a maritime and conference. Yes, yeah, the images uh, from that event, the same event. Okay, just letting you know there's, we have a lovely person in the audience who has been giving us the title, just called Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making yeah. and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities 2020. That's the text that um, 
Dr. Nyong'o was referencing. And he also um, indicated the, in, the commission of inquiry, the link is on the chat if you want to get it so that you can look at it after this as well. And I, I really want to recommend to a real um, discussion of that essay, Interna Internationalization of Black Power by Professor Edmondson. I think I'm going to use it in my, um, in my freshman writing class next um, fall. Thank you. Any question or comment, Indri? Do you want to come in? No. Uh, it's good night. So thank you, Dr. Nyango, for staying. I'm I'm really impressed. So we conclude. All the way. <laughs> See you yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Have a> good <laughs> rest. So we are concluding then. Kara. No, I'm just yeah, I'm I'm I haven't had any questions. So I wanted to give you space if you wanted to speak. Yeah. Or somebody raised their hand. Anna, Anna, can you write your comment, please? Or say it? There's another hand. Uh, Samba yeah. Sek. Samba. Samba Sek, right, but I'm not hearing yes. that. Hello? Okay, Samba Hi. Sek said, I have it. If Pan Africanism is a movement based on racial solidarity to fight oppression, the first step should be to fight the concept of people of color. It baffles me that Black folks take the term as legitimate. Any thoughts on that? people of color. And now there's even a wider term called BIPOC, Black Indigenous, Indigenous People of Color. So it's more extended than just people of color to make sure Indigenous people are included following Dr. Nyango's comment. Ultimately, ultimately, in the final analysis, Pan-Africanism is about being a human being. These color schemes have been imposed on human beings by capitalism. And we are entrapped in these color schemes of black or people of color as long as capitalism is around and we cannot develop as full human beings when until we transcend these racial hierarchies that comes with capitalism so yes probably for the next hundred years we'll be defining ourselves as black people against racism but as we develop in this era of digital humanities and digital finance and robotics, ultimately capitalism want to turn us into non-humans, dehumanize us. So the challenge of the Pan-African movement is how to fight to be human being. Thank you, Harris. Anybody else? No, that, that I just want to add, that was, uh, I, I mentioned the two brand of young student in Pan-Africanism. The second group that uh, was fighting for humanity it was their position that we cannot free only the African people on the continent, the African people in the diaspora. We have to see all oppression as oppression and fight. And if we go to the Bandung analysis in the contemporary modern era, uh, it has one perpetrator that is the capitalist system, the economic system as uh, uh, Horace was uh, referring to. So really, uh, we need to revisit some of those ideas and see that uh, many people have seen it before, a long time. And we need to uh, build on their work. And where we are, it telling us that they were right, that unless we free everybody who is oppressed, we will not be able to overcome the oppression of a few. So that was very powerful and far reaching in terms of their position. I can add one comment to that. We must remember that Kwame Nkrumah himself uh, uh, categorically uh, uh, refused to limit Pan-Africanism to black people. Uh, I mean, for him, it was at least people living on the continent, but, but I think in, in terms of of, uh, of uh, Dree's comments, uh, it was not specifically about skin color, but it was about some things that are that are far more important in terms of power and and uh, uh, and people's humanity. So, going back to the words of one of the articulators of of uh, Pan Africanism itself. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. There's another question. What challenges is Pan-Africanism faced in getting solidarity from individual Africans? I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part? What challenges does Pan-Africanism face in getting solidarity, I suppose in achieving solidarity or getting solidarity from other African countries, from individual African countries? Countries are, are citizens. Countries, nations, I suppose you can say. I can say that the question of countries as they are currently organized is a product of the Berlin Conference. And the Berlin Conference was one that divided the African peoples. So in Africa itself, the Pan-African project is to transcend the Berlin borders and to develop a space for the emancipation, freedom, and the dignity of African peoples. That means that the Africa would be united as one sovereign space with its own currency, its own foreign policy. Now, what the danger of Africanism that is being taught in the university is that we've seen in the United States of America that in the past year, we've seen the development of something called ADOS, the African descendants of slavery, that is seeking to drive a wedge between Africans who are oppressed in the United States of America and Africans who are oppressed from the Caribbean or Africans from Africa. And I think the solidarity that we need is the kind of solidarity that we've seen in Loxley Edmondson, um, Kwame Nkrumah, and those who had solidarity, whether they're from Haiti or Cuba or Jamaica or South Africa. And, and the internationalism that is that Pan-Africanism is anchored in is something that we cannot forget. Wonderful. Thank you, Harris. Well, I, yeah. I use the term consciousness in my own uh, paper for that uh, reason, because if we are educated in quotation mark or miseducated to use Carter Woodson's uh, framework, to think of ourselves as uh, uh, colonized by the British, by the French, uh, whether it is on the continent or the Caribbean or from the Anglo-Saxon tradition, that will not advance the cause. If we see ourselves, our definition, our identification to all those uh, layers that have been defined by others. Uh, and there is a deliberate effort in the so-called Francophone countries by the French empire to continue to separate us from the others. Why mm -hmm. Malcolm X was not granted a visa, <laughs> mm -hmm. permission to go to, to France. All this is very much important in dividing to rule. In another piece I wrote, I saw the year that um, uh, um, W.E.B. Du Bois died as the year of uh, big problems for Africa because it's the same year that OAU the, the Pan-Africanist perspective uh, was defeated by the neo-colonial uh, group that we need to respect the nation state. We didn't inherit, we didn't draw the borders, but we have to inherit them and manage them. Even for very progressive leaders such as Nyerere, he was among those who said, we didn't draw the borders, but this is the reality we have to manage. So, so these are some of the major challenges, but uh, uh, we are very much encouraged by the new technology also. It's doing a lot of work. The mm. way this solidarity, uh, the uh, cross-border uh, communication, uh, there are some, some signs of hope there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. What I want to do, if you don't mind, is ask Catherine Chipotle to speak maybe about getting the book and anything you'd like to say, Catherine, as we come into a close. We have about eight, a few more minutes before we end. Catherine, do you want to say something to about getting the book and ordering it from Africa? Well, I just want to say how much a pleasure it is to have worked with these two wonderful ladies great scholars who collated the papers, put them together. We have had some technical problems, 
but the problems are resolved now and the book will be out in honor of the master teacher, uh, Dr. Edmondson, a true Pan-Africans that I get a chance to know in my in and outs at Cornell University. Uh, he also used to visit us at Binghamton when I was uh, at the grad school. So I'm really a beneficiary of this opportunity to link up with the name of Edmondson through Carol, through Indiri. And I thank you all for this event. Thanks. And how can people get copies? Well, it will be on our website soon. And uh, AfricaWorldPressBooks.com and people can get it from there. So I am going to turn it over to my colleague uh, to thank everybody and to um, close us off. And I want to thank all the participants uh, from Professor Tyro, the ASRC chair, uh, all the speakers, and my, uh, my uh, co-editor, Professor Indri. Well, and Donna Pinnitsy, sorry. Donna Pinnitsy, I'm so sorry, Donna. All your work and staying here and making sure this happened too. Thank yeah. you, Donna. Donna, Eric, but I, I want to acknowledge that not everyone who attended the conference was able to put in writing the contribution. So we want to acknowledge them. And uh, uh, not everyone who wrote a piece, finalized his or her or their contribution was able to attend. We want to make sure we acknowledge them. So um, I know Peter, uh, well, he's now known by Anyang, but uh, we, we know him as Peter when we were students, the same way I was uh, known differently. Uh, he has now, uh, you know, left to have a few hours of sleep. But we want to thank all of you. It's a very, very special occasion for all of us. And uh, the same way the technology brings uh, these possibilities, uh, at the same time, we, we, it would be wonderful such a night to put on some music with some food. <laughs> and Professor Edmondson refers to Jamaica as Western Africa, to, to bring some Western African food and music. But we have learned from this COVID experience that we shall be able to bring those possibilities, organize, meetings where those of us who are in the same locality can come face to face while we bring uh, those who are far, who cannot make it. So this is really a new turning point for us to communicate, to celebrate. Professor Edmondson, thank you for giving us this opportunity. Professor Edmondson has been more than a colleague. As, thank you, as, as thank, parent, thank you for making yeah. this opportunity. <laughs> as a parent, uh, I, I shared, he, he helped me a lot when we came here, gave uh, useful information, and some of his children were of the same age and my, my, mine. So we, we share many, many other uh, um, areas of, of, of uh, connection and resources. So we want to acknowledge everybody and Kasaun, you have been already called. Really, uh, we need the space to have our papers, our words, our writing acknowledged. And we appreciate the rigor that you put in the work so that when it comes out, it has the quality that we're all proud of. So we want to acknowledge you for all the work that you're doing. And we want to continue to contribute we have to do our part, produce the, the, the document, and you will help us. So I want to take the opportunity to also thank uh, Professor Taiwo. Um, you appointed me as in that committee. It gave me the opportunity to contribute to, to bringing our colleagues together. And we will have the last celebration of the semester uh, next week when Professor Mugo uh, comes on. So 
we urge you to be ready to mark your calendars Wednesday, um, uh, May 5th. Uh, it was scheduled for um, Friday, May 1st last year. Uh, but because of the situation, we know it didn't happen. So maybe like a nice, I don't know the, if everybody will appreciate this uh, uh, culinary metaphors because of all this gender dimension brought in, but like a good sauce, you have to let it simmer. <laughs> so we hope that Professor Mugo will serve us with some powerful as usual uh, uh, a contribution in terms of urging us to rethink because the title of her presentation is an answer to some of the questions that we asked her as I saw them in the chat box. So it will be a continued conversation. So until next week. Uh, can I just say one thing, please? Yeah, of, of course. Yes. Yes. Um, the event that Professor Campbell invited you all to mm -hmm. tomorrow, uh, coordinated by the National Lawyers Guild, you know, the uh, announcement of that, uh, I'm happy to say, and I hope our ears are ringing, uh, is curated by a young Jamaican-American lawyer. Her name is Kerry McLean, and she's the one who has been the linchpin for this whole program, and it's my privilege to know her. But I wanted people to know that the Jamaican connection is not just from Jamaica College and Luxley and Horace. There's also people that we don't see, but who, as a result of Horace's uh, intervention, uh, I think we need to know them and to cooperate with them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that note. So, sure. Yeah. So I think so we're ready to sign thank you, up. Dana, thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay.